Hi guys, uh, this is Jonathan Lambert with the Mathematics Development and Support Service at the National College of Ireland. Uh, and this short video, uh, another video in our series of videos dealing with group frequency distributions, is going to concentrate on how to construct a group frequency distribution given a raw, given a raw data set. Okay? And this is example two. I've already got a video up in relation to how to construct a group frequency distribution. But this is just another example. Uh, I should point out that there's probably one small error in the previous video in, in example one. Uh, but in this example hopefully uh, there will be no errors yeah okay uh, so how do we go about constructing a group frequency distribution okay uh, there's a number of steps that we require okay uh, I'm just gonna put down the steps here so the steps okay uh, step one is to identify the sample size so let's say identify uh, the sample size okay the sample size uh, small n okay so small n is equal to how many observations we have and now in this case here I've got two for five observations in each row and the number of rows that I have is one two three four five six seven eight nine ten so I have ten rows so my sample size is five by ten so my sample size is equal to fifty and don't forget, the size of the sample determines how many classes we're going to have in our group frequency distribution. Okay, so step two then, step two is to uh, identify, identify or calculate, okay, identify the number, the number, the number of classes that we require, the number of classes, okay, uh, that we require, that we require. Okay, and the way we do that is we use what's known as the two to the power of k rule. Okay, so we're going to use use the two to the power of k rule. Okay, and the two to the power of k rule it's like if you go to a doctor and you're you you have you're reporting with particular blood pressure and you're trying to figure out whether your blood pressure is high or low, the doctor will ultimately look your blood your blood pressure up on a chart of some sort. So this is a chart that allows us to determine, depending on the sample size, what is an appropriate number of classes that we should have in our distribution. And the table looks something like this, okay? So the table looks something like this. The number of classes, K, is listed down the first column. We could have a distribution with one class, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on and so forth. And then what we calculate is we calculate 2 to the power of k, 2 to the power of these values that are listed down the first column. So when k is 1, 2 to the power of 1 is simply equal to 2. When k takes the value 2, 2 to the power of 2, that's k is going to be 2, 2 to the power of 2 is 4. When k is 3, we have 2 to the power of 3 is 2 times 2 times 2, which is 8. And when it's 4, that gives us 2 to the power of 4 is 16. When it's 5, 2 to the power of 5 is 22. When it's 6, when k is 6, 2 to the power of 6 is 64. And when k is 7, 2 to the power of 2 to the power of 7 is 128. Okay? So this table here allows us to identify how many classes we require. Just keep in mind this table never changes. It always looks something like this. Okay? So what we now do is we now we now inspect, we now inspect, inspect. Uh, down this row, this column here, okay, uh, we inspect to find the first, the first value, the first value that exceeds, that exceeds, exceeds n, our sample size, okay? So don't forget, our sample size is 50, so the first value that exceeds 50, well, 2 doesn't exceed 50, neither does 4, neither does 8, neither does 16, neither does 32, but 64 exceeds our 50, our sample size. So what I'm saying here is this, is that the number of classes that we should have, the first value that exceeds our sample size is this value here, 64. So the number of classes that we should have, k, the number of classes should be six classes in our distribution. Okay, so now that we know that we need six classes, the next step is that we identify the width of each class. So step three is to calculate, calculate, the class, the class width. Okay. Now to calculate the class width, we have a little formula. The formula says that the width is going to be equal to the range of the data set. Okay. Plus one. Now I'm adding on a little kicker here. One. One is the smallest unit with respect to the observations. The the I suppose the significance that the observations have been reported to. Okay. Divided by k, how many classes? Now don't forget the range. The range is 
The largest value in our data set, the maximum value, minus the smallest, the minimum value. So the largest value in this data set, I think we see that pretty, qu pretty quickly here. There's only one three-digit number, so the largest value is 106. And what we need to take away from that is the smallest value. And the smallest value, well, the smallest value in the first column is 20. There's no bigger value bigger than 20, uh, smaller than 20 in the first column. In the second column, there's no value smaller than 20. In the third column, there's no value smaller than 20. In the fourth column, there's no value smaller than 20 in the fourth column. In the fifth column, there is no value smaller than 20 in the fifth column. So the smallest value in our data set is actually 20. So that gives us a range, a range of 86. Okay? So the width of our classes should be, the width is equal to the range, which is 86, plus one divided by how many classes we should have. And the number of classes that we're saying that we should have, which we identified by this rule here, is six. Okay, so what we end up with here is we end up with is it's 87 divided by six. Let me just do that in the calculator here, so you know everybody everybody can see it. So it's it's 87 divided by six gives us a value of 14.5. So this gives us 14.5. And what we do now is we round up. Okay, so we take this value here. We'll just get a different marker so that we can actually see this. Okay, so we take this value here. Okay, and we round, we round. We round up. We always round that value up, okay? In which case we're going to say that our class widths are going to be equal to is equal to 15. So 14.5 rounded up is 15. Okay. So now that we know the range, sorry, now that we know the width of the classes, okay, what we can now do is we can actually construct the distribution. So that's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to construct our distribution. Okay. So to construct the distribution, I'll just leave the paper over here. Okay. Let's keep in mind is that the number of classes k is equal to 6 and the width of a class should be equal to 15. Okay. So to construct the distribution, okay, uh, we have our distribution that looks something like this. Okay. It's got a column, first column that represents the class widths or the class intervals. So here's our class intervals down here. Now this is typically, these intervals typically are more descriptive, they represent the variable that was measured, okay? So for example, if I was to ask if these values represented how much a student spent over the weekend, 70 euros, 81 euros, 42 euros, or if you'd like that in dollars, it's 70 euros, sorry, 70 dollars, 81 dollars, 36 dollars. If this, if these numbers were taken from the variable, uh, which was how much money was spent, these class intervals, the label here would be money spent, if that makes sense. So once we know the number of classes and the width, okay, we always start with the smallest value in our data set, okay. So the smallest value in our data set is 20, okay, so I'm going to start at 20, okay, and what I add on is I add on the class width. So 20 plus 15 gives me 35, okay. Then I take 35, and I add on the class width. So 35 plus 15 is going to give us a value of 50. Then I take 50 and I add on the class width, which is going to give me 65. Then I take 65 and I add on the class width, which is going to give me 80. Then I take 80 and I add on the class width, which is going to give me 95. And then I take 95 and I add on the class width, which is going to give me 110. Okay. The important thing here to note is that the lower bounds, these classes represent, they're going to be inclusive of lower bounds, exclusive of upper bounds. So when I'm counting